Hello everyone, Charcoal here, and welcome to another discussion video. Today we're continuing my Wings of Fire Arc 1 review series, where I work my way through the first five books of the series for the first time in almost a decade and give my thoughts on them, all leading up to a big video where I take every book in the main canon and rank them all. Next up is Book 3, The Hidden Kingdom. I actually reread this book a while before making this video for my appearance on the Outclaws podcast where we talked about it for a couple hours. As of this recording, it's up on Spotify right now and the YouTube version is being worked on. I'll leave the links in the description. Let's dive in. The prologue here finally introduces us to the false dragoness of destiny, Squid, Fatespeaker, Flame, Ochre, and Viper. And Moroseer has had enough of the Talons of Peace's bullshit and decides to train the False Dragonettes himself, which, as we all know, will come into play later. I wish the False Dragonettes were given a bit more time to show what each of their personalities are, because this whole chapter is just them hating each other. I will say, though, that's a great way to immediately set them apart from the main group. Our Dragonettes are a unit. They may have disagreements, but they stay together. The False Guys, on the other hand, clearly demonstrate that they are incapable of working together. That's about all there is here, so let's start the book. Gotta say, I like the world building here. Glory has spent the first two books swearing up and down that the Guardians were wrong about the Rainwings and all those stereotypes they brought up weren't true. And it makes sense, they do just sound like stereotypes, and the Guardians weren't exactly good about the Dragonette's education anyway, so the twist where it turns out the Rainwings actually are lazy idiots was honestly kinda funny. I don't think it was meant to be funny, but Glory's reaction to everything they do is just hilarious. But I do genuinely like how this plays into Glory's arc of reassuring herself that she doesn't have to be what everyone says she is. Because this is basically telling her, yeah, this is the rest of your kind, you're gonna end up like them. And as lazy as the Rainwings are in personality, I really like how fleshed out they are with their customs and all the other stuff that really sets them apart from the other tribes. Between sun time, venom training, sloth pets, etc., the Rain Kingdom feels lived in rather than just being a prop for the story. Queen Magnificent is very frustrating though, she's basically being told to her face that a dozen of her subjects have been kidnapped and she's refusing to do anything about it. I get we're supposed to be rooting for the the main character to solve the mystery, but come on. Moving on, I love the setup with the enchanted tunnel to the Sand Kingdom. We learned about Animus magic in the last book, but this is our main character's first time truly interacting with it, and I really like how serious it's treated. They have no idea what the specifics of the spell are, and they don't know how dangerous it might be. Yeah, remember the days when Animus touched objects were treated with a level of danger and seriousness like they were an unpredictable force to be reckoned with? Those were the days. Let's move on. I don't have as much to say about this section other than I think it's good. I really like the air of tension as the Dragonists explore the Sand Kingdom a bit and eventually meet Blaze. Although I have to question how Mangrove found Blaze's stronghold almost immediately when it's later established in Deserter that Burn's entire army spent months searching for it with no results, but I digress. In between all that, we're introduced to Deathbringer. I've ranted about this multiple times before, so I'll keep it brief. Just know that I hate all the romantic tension between him and Glory with a passion, but thankfully that's not a huge focus here. As a part of the narrative, Deathbringer does his job pretty well by basically acting as the median between the Dragonets of Destiny and the Nightwings. Speaking of the Nightwings, Glory's kidnapping is a huge moment because this is where we finally learn where the tribe has been hiding out all this time. I think it's over with a little too quickly, but I get it, this book has another climax in mind and we'll be spending plenty of time here in the next book. Now, I've noticed a pattern here. The Dragoness of Destiny came to the rainforest specifically to lay low for a while and calm down, and I don't know if this was intentional or just a happy coincidence, but ironically this book is where they've been facing their biggest challenges yet, interacting with Animus Magic for the first time, meeting a Nightwing in the wild, finally starting to uncover some of their secrets, overthrowing the Rainwing Queen… wait, what? Is it just me, or do these dragonets seem to bring absolute chaos wherever they go? Go to the Sky Kingdom, Scarlet supposedly dies. Go to the Sea Kingdom, the Summer Palace gets firebombed. Go to the Rainforest Kingdom, Glory challenges Magnificent for the throne with the intention to kill, might I add, since she doesn't know about the Rainwing Royal Challenge yet. Oh, and Scarlet Dream visits Glory, so yay, confirmation she's not dead. Hope you like waiting another five books for that to finally get resolved. The Royal Challenge itself is a pretty fun sequence. It's a great climax to Glory's arc. This is where she has to prove she can still be a Rainwing while also proving she's not destined to end up how all of her superiors have told her she'll end up. It's fun up until the ending. Glory being revealed to be descended from Rainwing royalty is what kills it for me, because it flies in the face of the entire lesson of the book. 
This book is trying to teach young readers that you're not defined by where you come from or what others perceive you as. You're defined by who you want to be, and you can still do amazing things. But then Grandeur throws all that out the window by calling off the competition and forfeiting the throne because Glory is royalty. I wasn't even against the idea of Glory becoming queen, because the concept is so crazy and out there that I just figured, f*** it, why not? But it comes at the cost of doing a complete U-turn on the moral. Have Glory actually win the competition, or have Grandeur forfeit because of Glory's show of selflessness and quick thinking. Or even have the current queens win, but have Grandeur fire the others and take responsibility herself with Glory as an advisor or something. It's not that hard. This was a really good read so far, but it didn't stick the landing very well at all. I'm kinda mixed on the cliffhanger at the end with Starflight disappearing. I get that there'd be some doubt about his intentions given how much time he spent with Moroseer in Book 1, but it rubs me the wrong way that everyone immediately assumes the worst and that he's gone to warn the Nightwings about the Rainwings coming for their prisoners. Now let's move on to the epilogue. The epilogue is pretty much just more of the false dragonets hating each other. This is the same stuff we just saw in the prologue, except this time on the Nightwing Island. And Fate Speaker notices a certain unconscious dragonet being dragged into the palace. It's not directly confirmed to be Starflight here, but come on, it's Starflight. So why bother giving the reader the idea that Starflight might have betrayed the group if you're just gonna confirm he didn't only four pages later? That immediately throws all the tension out the window. But with that, we've reached the end of the book. Book 3 is a huge improvement from the last one. First of all, I think the pacing is a lot better. The story feels like it's always moving and there aren't as many pointless scenes to pad out time. And between Animus Magic, the Rainforest, and even a bit of the Sand Kingdom, there's a lot of world building here. Maybe even the most out of the first 10 books now that I think about it. It has its flaws and it kind of botched the moral right at the finish line, but it's still a very enjoyable book. I really like it. I might go so far as to say I love it. Ah, screw it, I'm in a good mood. The Hidden Kingdom gets an 8 out of 10. Best of the arc so far. Now it's fan art time. Today we have pieces from Narzis, Ezekiel, Titanwing Everfury, Dragonboard, and Raptor 05. Thanks a bunch, guys. This has been Wings of Charcoal, and I will see you all in the next video.